Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending my talk today on the present and future of AI-enabled knowledge graph generation. There's a lot of exciting content to cover, so let's dive right in. We'll start with a bit of background. My name is Brendan Wong, and I'm a social impact and technology entrepreneur based in San Francisco. I wear a few other hats that are relevant to this presentation. I do some AI research, and I've also been involved in AI, data, and software development. I'm speaking to you today as the founder of Unice, which is a social impact organization with the mission of helping individuals and collectives organize knowledge and thinking with organizing knowledge and thinking uh, kind of like a knowledge graph. And we're applying that organized knowledge towards helping to solve major societal challenges, as well as helping users achieve their goals. And one area that has been very intriguing to us is using AI to help with our mission. One component of that is using AI to organize knowledge. Uh, and one facet of that organizing knowledge is graph generation. And I think that using AI to create knowledge graphs is a really exciting area. And we can look back at the promise of the semantic web from the early 2000s and see what ended up happening uh, to see why. So the semantic web was an attempt to organize the internet into a knowledge graph. For those that are unfamiliar, in the semantic web sense, a knowledge graph is a collection of typed entities. Like for example, uh, Cypher is a type of query language or Neo4j is a type of company and named relationships between those entities. Like for example, Cypher was created by Neo4j or Neo4j is located in San Mateo, California. This is sort of distinct from the current version of the internet, which has unlinked relationships between typeless pages. So the structure doesn't really make it clear exactly the knowledge that is, that is stored within it. So why is, is, a, is a global knowledge graph or knowledge graph in general useful? So in my view, the internet today is actually not an aggregation of human knowledge. It is actually a fragmentation of human knowledge into billions of pieces. What do I mean by, what do I mean by that? We can look at an example. So I view web pages as individual fragments of knowledge and they're very useful. Like for example, you can find information about nodes 2024 on the Neo4j website. Like for example, who is speaking and what they're speaking on and what time they're speaking. But what if you have more complex questions? Like for example, how many events about knowledge graphs are there in the world? Uh, if you want to answer that, you would normally have to analyze all the fragments out there and try to find every web page that has an information about an event to determine if it's the same event or not. Uh, and there could be many, many, many events about knowledge graphs out there. And so that would be incredibly cost and time prohibitive. But if all that information was already there in a knowledge graph, you could just run a query, count the number of events, and you would immediately have that answer. And that's just one type of complex question. There's a lot of more interesting use cases. Like for example, what if you wanna find out what events about knowledge graphs are close to me, cost less than $500 to attend, including the cost of travel to and from where I'm located and where the event is, and cover topics that you are personally interested in. That's one of the really powerful use cases uh, of something like the semantic web. And one area that's, a, that's particularly interesting to me is sort of using a global knowledge graph to even, for example, figure out all the perspectives there are around something like for example all the perspectives around ai and knowledge graphs uh neo4j's graph rag manifesto would actually be a very good example of a perspective and for every single perspective out there it'd be really cool if you could see all of the arguments and the evidence for all of those arguments and even what people think both about every single distinct piece of evidence as well as the arguments as well as the perspectives as a whole that's what i think is sort of a true example of an aggregation of human knowledge, where you can look at something and just see the state of all human, uh, all, all of humanity's knowledge about that topic in an instant. And the benefits of knowledge graphs extend to the internet, but that's also true for personal and organizational knowledge. So this all sounds very exciting. Uh, what happened to the semantic web? The semantic web was envisioned to be web 3.0, the next generation of the internet. And it, uh, however, the, you can have a look at this code example. So it required people to manually mark up websites with structured data. This is an example of Turtle, which is a markup language similar to Neo4j's Cypher language that is expressing relationships between entities. For example, here, we're saying that Nodes 2024 is hosted by Neo4j. And as it turns out, uh, as you can imagine, uh, manually marking up all this information is very difficult and very time consuming. Uh, furthermore, uh, there's actually, there wasn't really a strong incentive for people to do any of this. And it's actually only useful if everyone does it. For example, if only like 0.01% of the internet actually does this, then you know, the amount of knowledge you can extract from that is not very high. Doing this for content uh, even could even take 
for example, someone that wrote a blog article longer than the time it took to write the blog article it's, uh, itself to, to be able to structure all of the information in semantic web formatting. Uh, but what if you can use AI for this purpose? And that takes us into the present. So the great news is that LLMs can already transform unstructured data into structured data. Here is an example of me sort of putting a really short prompt into ChatGPT and having ChatGPT in this case, specifically GPT-4.0, turn a snippet about Nodes 2024 I pulled from the website into the same structured data we kind of saw in the previous example. So here it's able to do, you know, generate something very similar in Cypher. Uh, we, we can see that Nodes is, is, a, is, is, is a type of event and it is occurring on November 7th, 2024, and it's hosted by Neo4j. Talking a little bit more about LLM capabilities today, LLMs can do this sort of task uh, very effectively within a model's effective context window. First off, what do I mean by context window? Uh, context window refers to the maximum amount of textual input that an LLM can take in. Uh, and there's some advertised context windows now that are getting really large. Like for example, Google Gemini 1.5 Pro, which advertises 1 million tokens, which is equivalent to over 2000 pages of content. Uh, but unfortunately, just like consumer electronic devices and some other advertised performance statistics, I would say that there's, there's a pretty big issue with advertised context windows today, hence my usage of the term effective context window. Here we can see sort of an, an image from a study on long in context learning and LLMs. And we can see that even with, uh, with LLMs that have really long context windows, on even tasks of say a moderate complexity, if you pass in sort of information, performance rapidly deteriorates after a certain point. Like for example, for all of these API based LLMs here, you can see they're all basically hitting performance bottlenecks around 30,000 to 40,000 tokens. And you may note that that's only, for example, three to 4% of Gemini 1.5 Pro's advertised 1 million token context window. So unfortunately, we, do, we can't just like you know, paste in a whole book or something and get a coherent knowledge graph out. We are very, very limited by, by that. Uh, in my experience, I found that the effective context window for text to graph generation is around a few thousand tokens. Uh, and, and we're talking you know, pages, but not books there. And that also does not include the prompt, which may have to be quite, quite extensive. So we have even, even less room to work with when it comes to how much text we can process. But what if we don't just do this once? What if we do this multiple times? Uh, so this, of course, is, is a great idea and one way to overcome the context window problem. But the problem is LLM graph generation doesn't work well beyond one LLM call, because the problem is if you call the LLM once and then you call it again, it doesn't really have a great memory. It doesn't have any concept at all, actually, of what, what happened in the past. There, it's an entirely separate sort of instance of that LLM doing the work for you. So we can run into problems. Uh, for example, let's imagine that we have, this is a purely hypothetical article that let's say Neo4j wrote. And let's say that one sentence in one LLM call that's being, being sent from one part of that article to an LLM, it says, Michael Webb is a software engineer at Neo4j. Uh, so the LLM might spit out, for example, you can see here, Michael Webb is a person, is, is, is a software engineer and works at Neo4j. Uh, but then let's say we have, a let's say a sentence at the very end of that document. And that says, we're grateful to have Michael and Ben at Neo4j. Uh, in that case, uh, we can we can see the LLM spit out something that's not that's not the same the same entities but perhaps they a little bit different or if they could be exactly the same it really just depends on the, on the text snippet right because that LLM doesn't have greater context of uh, for example the whole document so here uh, Neo4j wasn't uh, wasn't a isn't created as, a, as as an entity that's the type company it's created as uh, with the same name uh, but with the type entity which is which is not the same and we can see for example that Michael could just create get created as Michael rather than Michael Webb. Uh, and of course, it can, it, you know, this, this causes huge problems because if you're just, you know, putting all the output straight into a knowledge graph, you're going to have a huge number of duplicates emerge and it can actually be, you know, even very difficult to tell, you know, what's going on. And if you try to run those, those complex questions, try to get that out of the graph, as I was describing earlier, well, you might get the count of, you know, the count of people that work in Neo4j is, is far greater than, than the appropriate number, or it might actually be far smaller because they've all been tagged with differently labeled relationships. So LLMs today, or even a system like this that calls an LLM multiple times, is really good at entity recognition, which is kind of recognizing that there are multiple entities in a sentence, but very bad at entity disambiguation, which is kind of figuring out, oh, like, is this the same, you know, as Neo4j here, the same Neo4j uh, that was previously generated? 
And a lot of systems today, or in fact, almost all of them that I've seen, appear to operate in this manner. And, and, so, and so thus they achieve pretty low performance because their generated graphs have all of these problems. How can we overcome some of these limitations? So we need to apply scaffolding, uh, which, and by that I mean a sort of a supporting architecture on top of LLMs and their inputs and outputs in order to also achieve high performance on entity disambiguation. So over here, this is the flow of sort of Neo4j's LLM graph transformer contribution to uh, Langchain, Langchain being one of the more popular or arguably the most popular open source framework for using LLMs in a variety of different ways. And you can see that what uh, Neo4j is doing here is for the entities that the LLM spits out, it is using text embeddings to cluster those entities so that you can kind of get similarly named entities kind of in one cluster. And then it is feeding that cluster into an LLM and the LLM is deciding whether or not those entities are the same or not the same. So this seems really interesting. And we're definitely hitting new frontiers here, right? Because I think this was, this you know, progress has only been happening since, since um, sort of a certain point in time in, in 2024. Uh, very quickly, we are shifting from generating questionable graphs using free LLM technology to generating coherent graphs from a paragraph using LLMs to generating graphs from much, much vaster inputs with kind of the scaffolding example in Langchain as, as, as an example of that. And so this sort of begs the question, well, you know, since we're talking about the present, how well does all of this work today? So the interesting thing is because the progress has actually been so fast, there are no existing benchmarks for generating graphs on large amounts of text because that previously wasn't possible. I've done a lot of searching and other people I know, researchers, they've also done a bunch of searching. We haven't found any yet. If you do know, please do get in touch. Uh, but for this reason, we created our own at UNICE called KG Storage. And it's important to note a bunch of caveats with this data because we're about to look at, at some of that to this presentation. Uh, but it, it's very difficult actually to create benchmarks like this because just like the problem with the semantic web, like, you know, internally, we have to look at these really long documents and convert them into knowledge graphs, which could be hundreds of nodes, hundreds of relationships. And then to actually grade the performance of any sort of generation system, like for example, Langchains, uh, we need to actually hand compare each node, each relationship and each entity. Uh, so we are currently trying to work with researchers from IBM and other institutions to sort of sc to scale this up and, and as well as sort of make this sort of hopefully one of the one of the benchmarks that can lead lead the space in terms of generating knowledge graphs at a much, much larger scale than has ever been possible before. With that all in mind, though, let's have a look at the performance of some of the currently available systems. Hmm. I don't know if that's looking too good. So we can see, and this isn't a surprise, but we can see that GPT-4.0, if you feed in a longer input, this is about this is about two documents, one that's kind of medium length, one that's that's, that's pretty long. And 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 we were sort of these performance metrics are are once we sort of you know resolve the entities across both of those documents into one coherent knowledge graph. So it's a little bit more of a challenging task. It's even cross-document graph generation. We can see that if you just use GPT-4.0, or this would be the same for any other LLM on this, the numbers will be really low because there'll be an incredible number of duplicate nodes. Uh, and and a lot of other things that don't really make sense in the graph, like relationships that, that that don't perfectly line up with each other. So we can see that the accuracy here is very low. And the accuracy of a lot of the open source frameworks in this space as well, like uh, for example, Llama Index, r to r and Microsoft's uh, GraphRag repository, they all use a very similar approach to basically just unaided LLM spitting a bunch of stuff out. The only reason I say they have, in theory, slightly higher accuracy versus an unaided LLM is because they do at least deduplicate based to my understanding, based on the name of the node itself. So for example, in our, in, in our previous example, if you had two Neo4j's, for example, uh, those, those could be merged because they have the same name. Of course, you may or may not actually wanna merge two Michaels. So it's actually unclear what the exact performance differences would be due, due to the sort of nature of our, our understanding of these systems. Um, we, didn't, we didn't have the time yet to benchmark those, but I would be pretty confident that that would be the results we would see. Um, but the great news is with some of the scaffolding we're seeing, uh, that's leading to a substantially higher performance that is possible in any other system today. Kudos to Neo4j. Uh, so for example, with LLM Graph Transformer, we are seeing sort of, at least on this very difficult benchmark, 57% performance on, for example, node accuracy, which is how are the nodes correct or not? And this, this sort of excludes nodes that are duplicated, but also nodes that are wrong for other sorts of reasons. So given what we've previously discussed though, I, I'm kind of curious, yeah, why isn't the performance high? Is there any way to make it higher? Uh, and with that, let's transition into the future. So the great news is actually, you know, <laughs> performance might actually be looking pretty good at this point in time. Uh, so at Unize, we've developed Unize Storage, which is a system that 
can uh, is also generating knowledge graphs from text. And we've been able to achieve pretty high accuracy, actually, even on this pretty challenging task. And it's important to note, this is the preview release of the system. So there's a lot of improvements that could potentially be made. But even with that, uh, we've been able to achieve node accuracy that is quite high, as well as just overall accuracy that is pretty high as well. And so in terms of my projections for this space, I think there is no reason we cannot achieve human level performance uh, today, or at least near human level performance. Uh, LLMs are already capable, in my view, of performing all reasoning necessary to generate coherent knowledge graphs at scale. But the numbers we've seen haven't necessarily been super, super high, though. How can we increase performance? Uh, and how did we achieve such good performance results? And my response to this is we need to increase the amount of reasoning that is occurring in the scaffolding. So I'm going to jump into an example here. So we're going to use sort of AI to, to answer questions or just retrieve knowledge as sort of example here when thinking about how to apply more reasoning into scaffolding. So this is an unscaffolded example just to start with, right? You're asking an LLM a question, it spits out an answer. The LLM may not have the necessary knowledge though, right? Or it may hallucinate an answer to your question, which, which, which is not good. And so one very popular uh, solution for this is to use retrieval augmented generation, which is basically fetching information from a knowledge base and feeding that into the prompt of the LLM along with the question to have it generate, hopefully, a more correct answer, assuming the information is in your knowledge base. Uh, and I think we have a whole talk on, on that at Nodes. I'm not going to go into the details, but the cliff notes are essentially you can get a document, you can split it up into a bunch of different textual chunks. Uh, because each chunk would presumably have a different meaning, right? You're on a, let's say on a sentence, or normally this is maybe more on like say a paragraph basis. And when the user asks the input question, instead of feeding that directly into the LLM, you would actually compare using text embeddings, the similarity of that question with all the chunks across one or all of the documents in your knowledge base. And, and hopefully that text similarity returns chunks that are similar, uh, meaning they have like hopefully the answer or at least part of the answer to the question you're asking. Then once you do that, you actually then take the question with the relevant chunks and you feed that into the LLM. And so as long as those chunks contain the full part of that answer, the answer uh, will be correct. And of course, the reason why we need all this chunking is again, do that effective context window problem. Uh, but there could be an issue, right? For example, in a very large knowledge base, there may be a lot of, a lot of things that appear to be related to your answer that might even achieve a pretty high similarity score using text embeddings, but may not actually be relevant for the question that is being asked or may not contain the answer. And so I think this is one potential deficiency, or one, de well, one deficiency of retrieval augmented generation. Uh, how, what's one way we can address that? Uh, so I, I call this flow agentic, agentic essentially rag. And what you can, what you can do here is instead of simply using text embeddings and then just feeding that straight into the LLM, which runs the risk of running the wrong chunks in, you can actually apply more reasoning, right? You can actually insert an LLM to evaluate the relevance of each chunk and kind of use LLMs to reweight all of the similar chunks. And, and, and LLMs are normally much, much better at discerning whether something is relevant than, for example, just using text embeddings. So you can apply LLMs to do this and then feed in just the right scoring chunks into the into the prompt along with the question the user asked, and that will increase the overall performance of sort of a regular rag-based flow. And as an example, as an example of this, uh, we can actually see that this is Codium, uh, which is a sort of a unicorn AI code generation startup uh, has pretty good performance, and it is actually using exactly what I just described. Uh, from the code base, they're pulling all the relevant chunks of code, which the, with the system needs to generate code. It needs to understand how the code affects or pertains to the rest of the code base. Uh, embeddings aren't enough for them, right? They, they need to use an additional reasoning layer, and they're re-ranking everything, as you can see, before it's being passed to the generation model. So this helps the system make the most use of the effective context window, because if you can get all the right chunks in, then you should get a much better answer. How can we apply this? Uh, to the scaffolding for graph generation we were talking about earlier. So this is just a really hypothetical flow I, I mocked up for, for, the, for the exact flow that we previously discussed regarding how Langchain is doing entity disambiguation. So for example, you could hypothetically feed in an input cluster. You can compare that input cluster with, with other sorts of entities that didn't make it into that cluster, uh, but could possibly be in that cluster, right? Like for example, Michael and Michael Webb, if they wouldn't normally be clustered together, but they would at least be similar, in a, or, or a close distance in vector space, you can sort of do that check and you can say evaluate for Michael and you can evaluate for other names, other sorts of matches and have an LLM determine the relevance. And then once you finalize your input cluster and you're confident that that's correct, you would feed that into the LLM. Because in Langchain system, if the cluster is not incorrect and contains entities that should have been contained in that cluster but were not, uh, that, will, that will compromise the overall performance because that will create duplicates. So that's just an example here. 
and uh, what are my projections for the performance of these systems moving forward? Uh, so SD0.5 is actually very much not performance optimized, and there's a lot of low-hanging fruit that I'm aware of to improve performance. So given my knowledge of effective sort of graph generation scaffolding methods, as well as present-day LLM capabilities, I anticipate that a system with human-level performance on graph generation will emerge within 6 to 24 months. Very exciting. Uh, now, you, you may think for a second, though, hmm, if we're using all of this reasoning in our scaffolding, what is the effect of, on, on the cost? Uh, and the answer is uh, sort of at least the apparent bad news is that ST0.5 is about 19 times more expensive <laughs> than, than uh, uh, sort of generating the graph uh, using an LLM using, for example, just GPT-4.0. And, and by the way, that 4.0 line and then estimated cost uh, also also applies to uh, you know uh, sort of other frameworks like Langchain and other things that aren't using a lot of reasoning, right? Because most of their expense will be driven by the input text and the resulting output. Uh, and, and so again, these numbers actually not it's not exactly 19 times higher. Like the costs can vary, of course, just based on, for example, the number of entities generated. Uh, and so this is just an example we we pulled from a, from a 10,000 character article. So you would expect either higher or lower costs depending on the complexity there. Uh, but this is just an example. And so that's not looking too good, right? Uh, but I think the good news is that Etsy 0.5, not only is it not performance optimized, it's actually not cost optimized, right? So based on low hanging fruit that I'm aware of, I think we can achieve a 75% reduction in cost within a few months. I've just marked 12 months here to be conservative, given that due to resourcing, we do have other priorities. Uh, but we can see that the, that the total cost here is, is now getting a, quite a bit closer to GPT-4.0. And I do expect, though, on, on a slightly longer term time scale, we're actually going to be able to achieve cost reductions of 95%. Plus, and that will take us to below GPT-4.0's costs in order to generate a coherent graph on inputs. And you know, this isn't just completely ungrounded. Uh, you know, Codium, of course, has a lot of money to invest in their architecture, and they reported a 99% cost reduction using a fully custom, vertically integrated architecture. So it's definitely possible, even for other, to achieve a much better perform, uh, cost reduction than this in a much shorter period of time. Uh, you know, we're simply we're simply limited by resourcing. And regardless of the amount of present day optimizations that are that are possible, it's always important to keep in mind that LLM costs are expected to fall dramatically. Uh, for example, Andrew Ng, a big thinker of the space, recently estimated a 79% cost reduction per year with LLMs, just projecting what we've seen over the last year and a half. And that might be an overestimate, uh, or, or maybe it's an underestimate, right? It's, it's hard to know at this point. But definitely big cost projection is expected, and that's really, really exciting for this space. So in terms of uh, sort of what I see for future use cases, this is where it's starting to get very interesting. Uh, so one interesting fact you may not be aware of is actually the cost of running GPT-4.0 on the entirety of English language Wikipedia, assuming you use GPT uh, OpenAI's deferred processing and assuming that output tokens are about 25% of the input size, uh, that only costs $17,625 today right now. Uh, and given the cost projections we've just looked at, uh, at that cost, once you know, we bring the cost of effective uh, graph generation down to the cost, for example, of 4.0 or lower, uh, at that cost, any organization can just, can just should be able to afford, say, a few thousand dollars and generate their own semantic web on actually on all of human knowledge, <laughs> or at least, you know, in, at least English Wikipedia, right? Not like the entire internet that would be far more costly, but that's definitely, you know, that, that's a representation of a, lot, of a lot of the information that exists out there. And so I think I think that's very exciting, and I do expect that something like the semantic web will emerge in the next few years as a result of the declining cost and improving accuracy of LLM-based graph generation. Uh, some of the longer-term projections on this is eventually the cost is going to fall so low that this might become useful for you know a bunch of organizations, a bunch of individuals. Uh, you might actually want to start generating customized graphs uh, for your particular purposes. And the really interesting thing there is you could even do so in a manner. Uh, that where your, your where your personal graph uh, connects to global graphs, uh, thus merging personal and societal knowledge. As an example of this, uh, let's say you add information about restaurants and dishes you like into your personal graph. Uh, your personal graph could then sort of look out there at the global graph and pool restaurants and dishes you might like, and then anon anonymously contribute your preferences into the global graph. And that can help other people that are that are looking for dishes. You know, see if, if you like those. Maybe they're likely to like those as well. Uh, just 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 as, as an example there. And before larger scale uses, though, I do think we're going to see, of course, a lot of adoption on personal and organizational sort of uh, knowledge bases and use cases. So one much more practical uh, sort, of, uh, sort of implementation of this is to have a graph generation system, let's say, for example, read all of your Slack messages, all of your Confluence pages, and sort of automate uh, or like greatly assist with the process of automating task tracking, right? So for example, if, you, if someone just says, oh, I've completed this task, you don't need to like say, go into Jira and update the status of the task. Or if they say I'm blocked due to this reason, you can even auto create the task 
auto link it into an existing task. Really, really exciting uh, possibilities there. In terms of my uh, projections about sort of where the AI and AI graph generation space and technologies are going to head, uh, I think one really interesting implication of reduced costs is that you don't need to generate a graph just one time from the text. Uh, you can actually continuously update graphs based on, for example, changes in the text or just even if you need more information out of the graph in case your graph cannot effectively represent everything. Uh, as an example of this, uh, and this is sort of what I mean by my point here, we will see a unification of agentic graph storage and retrieval. So for example, what if you asked your retrieval system? I don't know, like I would like to see all the arguments, you know, about, you know, kind of the beginning, the example I used in the beginning of the talk, right? All of the arguments in favor of, of you know, let's say, you know, and against the, the graph rag, you know, graph rag manifesto. Uh, that information may not actually have been represented as nodes and, and arguments in the graph that might require even novel reasoning in order to generate those relationships. You could actually dynamically generate that if you don't have that answer uh, sort of in the knowledge graph, but and, and users asking the question, the retrieval system can determine we don't have the answer, we need to go out and we need to generate it, and then that can be generated, and then you will receive your answer. So I think that that's going to make it, that's going to make, that's gonna make, you know, that's going to have, that's going to have, uh, that's going to have the, that's going to be how the retrieval and, and the storage space changes, and that's going to be, uh, of course, really great for end users, because if the knowledge is there, regardless of whether or not it is in the graph or not, you will be able to find your answer. And as ge graph generation improves, I think that we're also going to see graph retrieval take off, uh, of course, because one of the big limiting factors today is the difficulty of generating the graphs themselves, and the fact that there's not a lot of them, not a lot of them, there's no semantic web out there, right? So you can you kind of need both sides of, of the coin. And I think that in terms of everyday users, you'll see these improvements in, for example, other systems, other LLM interfaces like ChatGPT may switch to using graph retrieval uh, once those systems uh, become viable and low cost enough. And then, of course, you know, all those benefits will pass down to end users. I do expect that these systems will remain, uh, graph generation systems will remain more expensive than just doing regular RAG. Uh, so I expect them to be used on smaller and more important data sets first. All right. Uh, with that, thank you so much for attending the presentation. Uh, we can now go into questions. Uh, before then, though, just a couple quick things. If you are interested in trying out uh, UNI storage, you can check out our playground. Uh, anyone can just you know, run it, doesn't require any coding experience, or our API. And all that is available at developers.unice.org. If you're kind of interested in the broader vision of, of what we're building at Unice, you can check out web10.ai. You can uh, sign up for the wait list for our upcoming app launch at unice.org. And you get updates about our AI systems and the Unice app itself and overall project at blog.unice.org. And if I, you know, we are running a little bit close to time here, so if I don't have time to take your question, uh, please feel free to reach out with any comments, questions, suggestions, ideas, anything you want. My email address is on screen, brendan at unice.org. Thanks again. I'm now going to have a look at some of the questions.